The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, first of all, for joining us. We are just going to wait for two more minutes for a few more people to uh, get online, and then we will start the webinar. Thank you for your patience. Okay, hello, welcome everyone uh, to this IEA webinar, um, Bioenergy Forecast for Heat, Power and Transport from the Renewables 2018 Market Report. Um, thank you everyone for taking the time to, to join us now for this webinar. Uh, my name is Ferro Lefer. I work in the Renewable Energy Division of the IEA, where I cover bioenergy, uh, looking across heat, power and transport. So today we're going to be kind of providing content from our Renewables 2018 Market Report. So this is an annual publication. Uh, we released this in October last year. Um, and what we do in this report is we first of all provide a baseline for what happened in renewables the year before. So that's 2017 for this version. Uh, so we look at what happened in renewable heat, power and transport. And then we provide a forecast looking forward uh, into the future, uh, in this case to 2023. So you'll see that year quite a lot uh, in the slides. And as, as I said, we cover renewables across all three sectors. Now in 2018, we actually had uh, enhanced bioenergy coverage. We had a special focus. And this was part of a kind of series of analysis from the IA looking at what we call blind spots in the energy system. So we've looked at road freight, we've looked at cooling, we've looked at petrochemicals, and we wanted to also add bioenergy as well. And we, we feel that these are areas which are very important and they do not receive uh, due attention. So in the next 35 to 40 minutes, I'm gonna be sharing the, the key uh, results from our global bioenergy analysis. Um, please note you are in listen-only mode, so you won't be able to, to talk during the webinar, uh, but you can submit questions uh, through the webinar platform. And at the end, we have uh, made some time to, to go over these. Um, so, I think now we can start the presentation. So, in the next 35 minutes or so, I really want to cover these key questions. So, what role does bioenergy play in the energy system? What are the global prospects for bioenergy in the power sector? How is bioenergy used in industry and where can it scale up? To what extent are biofuels making inroads into the transport sector? and under what conditions could bioenergy deployment accelerate. So first of all, we're gonna start with some general slides. So looking across the whole energy system, modern bioenergy provides half of all renewable energy. So when we say modern bioenergy, we are not counting uh, what we call the traditional use of biomass, which is the use of biomass for cooking and heating in developing countries and emerging economies. Uh, that's very big, but we are leaving it to one side 
I'm focusing on uh, modern sophisticated biomass fuel, bio, biofuels, uh, biomass for electricity use in industry, et cetera. Um, now, bioenergy's significant contribution is aided by the fact uh, it can be used across electricity, heat, and transport. Uh, however, deployment differs by sector, as most bioenergy is used in heat, uh, as you can see, and almost two thirds of that heat is in industry. Now, looking at the left, despite the rapid deployment of wind and solar PV getting a lot of attention, uh, in energy terms, their contribution actually at the current time remains uh, far smaller. Um, and then moving over to the right again, when we look at electricity, we can see that bioenergy is just one of a portfolio of renewable options in the electricity sector. Um, but when we look at heat and transport, it is the principal. Uh, renewable option at the current time. Now, that was 2017, so now looking forward in the forecast. Um, so first of all, on this slide, what we've shown actually is, is historically, so bioenergy led renewable consumption growth in the last five years, uh, as you can see there, followed by wind. But how does this picture change in our forecast? So what you can see here is that bioenergy continues to lead renewables growth in the overall energy mix. So we're covering here all three sectors. Um, and it actually grows by more than the previous period. Um, now, in terms of how that breaks down, uh, around 60% of that growth is for heat, 25% for electricity, and 15% for transport biofuels in energy consumption terms. Um, what else can we see on this slide? Well, we can see solar PV. Uh, reaches a level similar to wind with very rapid growth, uh, and hydropower's contribution remains roughly stable. Now, overall, when we consider all technologies, uh, renewables are expected to meet 40% of global energy consumption growth uh, over our forecast period. Now, the penetration of renewables is increasing. Uh, across the energy system. So the share of renewables in final energy consumption was around 10.5% in 2017. Now, by the end of our forecast in 2023, we see this rising to around 12.5%. However, the share of renewables uh, changes uh, very significantly by sector. So electricity leads the way, uh, reaching a share of close to 30% by 2023. However, electricity only accounts for 20% of final energy consumption. And the shares in heat and transport, as you can see, are far lower. Uh, so heat is actually the green line, which is almost overlapping the, the share of all renewables there. Um, and also, these, are, these shares are continuing to grow slowly. So renewables are only just uh, outpacing uh, fossil fuel demand growth in heat uh, and transport. And that's because these sectors have additional barriers than electricity that require greater policy attention. And support policies have been critical for expanding renewable energy consumption globally. So firstly, we can see support for renewable electricity is robust. So over 2010 to 2017, the number of countries with policies for renewable electricity support doubled to 120. Uh, and you can also see here, there's a wide geographical spread for that support. Over the same period, transport biofuel mandates almost tripled to reach 90 countries. However, despite the fact it's the largest end use sector, um, policy support for renewable heat is widely neglected, uh, especially outside of the European Union. Now what we're gonna do, uh, is we're going to move and discuss each of the three sectors in turn. So starting with bioenergy for electricity. Now what we can see here is capacity growth uh, by renewable technology over five-year periods. So 2006 to 2011, 2012 to 2017, and 2018 to 2023. Uh, so the first thing that's obvious is wind and solar PV lead a real transition in the electricity sector. Bioenergy accounts for around 3.5% of renewable capacity additions in our forecast. And when we look historically, we can see that actually it's remained relatively stable in terms of deployment 
uh, since uh, 2006, uh, as shown on the graph. Um, and this is because biomass power generation technologies play an important role in certain countries, but we don't observe them expanding aggressively into many new markets. Um, so around 90% of all bioenergy capacity in the power sector is contained in just 26 countries. Um, we do see exceptions to this though. For example, Mexico and Turkey, uh, we see as new markets where bioenergy is growing. Now, in 2017, average generation costs for hydropower, for onshore wind, and for some bioenergy technologies were actually lower than solar PV. Yet solar PV accounted for 40% of renewable capacity additions over the past five years. So th there are other factors that are supporting solar PV deployment. Um, and these are, for example, the range of scales over which it can be deployed. So we're talking here from watt to gigawatt scale. Uh, shorter development timescales, so less issues around social acceptance, around height, around resource estimation. Relatively quick construction compared to other technologies and low operation and maintenance costs. Now, conversely, when we look at uh, bioenergy, uh, bioenergy benefits from economies of scale, but larger projects face longer development timelines, so more uh, in-depth permitting, for example. Uh, biomass projects are also often bespoke, so that increases the investor risk. And also fuel supply chains need to be established, which is a crucial force. Now, here we can see annual bioenergy capacity additions by global region. And there are three conclusions we can draw on this slide. Um, so first of all, from 2018 to 23, we forecast global annual additions in the range of five to eight gigawatts. So the first conclusion is that a rapid acceleration of bioenergy deployment is not anticipated over the forecast uh, compared to what we've seen historically. So globally, we forecast bioenergy capacity to reach 158 gigawatts by 2023, um, which is around 23% growth over the forecast. Now, the second point we can see on this graph is that Asia is expected to account for two thirds of growth over the forecast period. So deployment is led by China uh, with energy from waste, but also some biomass cogeneration for buildings and industry, making contributions to the forecast. Japan is also a major market due to a, a large pipeline of projects as a result of its uh, generous feed-in tariff scheme. Um, elsewhere in Asia, deployment is driven by emerging economies with increasing electricity demand, ample feedstocks, and long-term targets. Um, now, despite only accounting for a small share of capacity additions, as I showed on, on a previous slide, bioenergy share of generation remains prominent. So by 2023, we still expect it to account for around 9% of all renewable generation. And part of this is because of uh, higher capacity factors for wind and solar PV, so more generation per gigawatt of capacity for bioenergy than the other, those other technologies. Now, just to take you through some notable market developments over the last year or so. So first of all, we can see there's a varied landscape for these changes and how they affect deployment. And that's shown by the, the relatively simplified impact uh, arrows on the right-hand side. Now, taking China, for example, uh, the 100 Counties Initiative aims to install 3.8 gigawatts electric of biomass cogeneration over 2018 and also 2019, I would expect. Um, and the aim of this is really the driver for it is to reduce the infield burning of agricultural residues, so finding an alternative use for these, uh, and also to offset coal use for uh, heating. So it's very much air quality driven. Japan has transitioned from awarding new large scale biomass capacity via feed in tariffs to an auction scheme. And the first of these auctions was held in December. Um, but we don't expect the auctions uh, to deliver the same uh, quantity of capacity as the feed-in tariff uh, scheme did. In Germany, existing plants must compete against older projects whose feed-in tariff has expired. Uh, and in the last two auctions, these uh, older legacy projects accounted for two-thirds of awarded uh, capacity. 
Well, in Brazil, we there's a new Renova Bio policy. This is primarily aimed at uh, transport biofuels, but we, we expect it to increase ethanol production and in turn, bagasse generation capacity at sugar mills and ethanol mills. Just take a short break to have a drink of water. Okay, so on this slide, the results uh, I've shown previously were for the main case. So that's what we think will happen given observed markets, drivers and barriers. We also undertake an accelerated case indicating the growth which could be achieved under more favorable market and policy conditions. Now overall in the accelerated case, capacity could increase by an additional 19 gigawatts. Uh, we think that China has scope for further energy from waste development given pressing waste management drivers and continued biomass uh, CHP initiatives could also be announced. In the EU, we consider deployment could increase further from uh, full delivery of plants awarded subsidy via SDE plus auctions in the Netherlands, uh, potentially more robust uh, biogas cogeneration development in uh, France with further auctions. While in Nordic countries, there may be further scope for even higher levels of municipality driven biomass cogeneration projects uh, and fossil fuel uh, plant conversions to, bio, to biomass. Now, in India, there is also scope to scale up if a dedicated bioenergy mission was introduced. So this is a kind of overarching initiative, including a series of policy measures to promote deployment. Uh, for example, previously, there has been a, a dedicated solar mission, for example. Now, taking a look at energy from waste, which I've mentioned a couple of times in an Asian context. So the urbanization trends shown in the six Asian countries on the left-hand side graph. So that's Thailand, Pakistan, India, China, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Uh, so over 2000, and when you combine these urbanization trends with population growth over 2010 to 16, this resulted in an additional 160 million city dwellers in these countries. Now this combined with economic growth higher than the global average in all of these countries means solutions are needed to dispose of increasing volumes of municipal solid waste. Now, energy from waste, if it's employed correctly in the context of the waste management hierarchy, offers a more effective means of waste disposal than landfill. And it also has the potential to provide energy at the point of demand. Now, looking at the right-hand side graph, we can see China is robustly expanding energy from waste. Uh, now, deployment has grown on average by 25% uh, per year over the past five years, and it's now the largest form of bioenergy capacity. Now, deployment in China is supported by a feed-in tariff, low-cost loans, and also fiscal support. Um, however, energy from waste potential is largely unexploited in the other countries mentioned. Uh, so you can see that in the orange area on the right-hand side graph which represents the other uh, five countries combined. But of course, these have very similar pressing waste management challenges. Now this may change uh, over a forecast period. So policy support is strengthening uh, in these countries for energy from waste uh, with guaranteed offtake in India and Vietnam and a feed-in tariff in Thailand, Indonesia and Vietnam. However, the key driver in all countries will be very simply more advanced uh, waste collection and sorting infrastructure. This is the, the base level step uh, to, to uh, deliver energy from waste and of course higher up the waste management hierarchy, recycling, etc. Okay, so now we're going to move to discuss bioenergy in industry. Um, what I would say here is uh, just to remind you to you can submit questions if you have any on the webinar platform. Okay, so the looking at industry here, uh, which accounts for two thirds of bioenergy for heat, um, the picture changes by industry subsector, and the key determinant here is whether biomass waste and residues are produced on site and therefore available for use for energy purposes. Now, industries which fall into this category um, account for almost all bioenergy in industry. 
And we can see this on the graph from looking at a selection of energy intensive industries. <clears throat> so on the left hand side graph, uh, on the left hand side, iron and steel and chemicals. So these are two industries with the largest energy demand. However, they don't create uh, significant quantities of biomass waste and residues on site. And as you can see, uh, bioenergy accounts for a very, very low share of their energy demand. And this is, of course, first of all, there would need to be a biomass fuel, uh, fuel supply chain would need to be established. And then this also needs to be econ economic versus the incumbent fossil fuels used. Now, moving to cements, we can see that bioenergy plays a slightly larger role here and has scope to scale up, which I will outline on some following slides. Uh, well, on the right-hand side graph, uh, right-hand side, we can see uh, pulp and paper, where bioenergy meets around 30% of demand with extensive use of black liquor and other uh, biomass residues which are produced on site. Now, moving to discuss cement. Uh, so, cement is the third largest uh, industrial energy consumer. Uh, and however, although bioenergy uh, and waste only supplied 5% of energy demand in 2017, we do think there is considerable scale to uh, increase this. And the key drivers for this would be, first of all, offsetting coal use. Secondly, it can provide a means of municipal solid waste disposal. Thirdly, this uh, waste disposal would have lower investment costs than a dedicated waste to energy plant. And uh, finally, this all of this uh, would only require technology which is already mature. So on the right-hand side graph, when we look at the red dot, we can see that Europe leads the way in using alternative fuels, particularly municipal wastes. And currently, biomass uh, and waste share in certain countries, so for example, Germany and Poland, are far higher than the EU average. Moving across to the left-hand side graph, what we can see, though, is that the EU only accounts for a small share of global cement production. So if the robust waste management frameworks present in Europe, uh, which create a cost for waste disposal, were established in key cement producing countries, we think that biomass and waste uh, could scale up and potentially meet something like 13% of energy demand in 2023 uh, in an optimistic outlook. Now, staying with cement, uh, so currently coal is a source of 70% of the thermal energy consumed in the cement industry globally, uh, and the quality requirements of thermal coal used in cement are lower than for electricity generation, and therefore its cost is actually generally quite low, so in the region of less than $3 per gigajoule. Uh, so consequently, it's challenging, as shown on the slide, for higher quality biomass fuels, such as wood chips or wood pellets, to compete on a fuel cost basis. However, refuse drive fuel, animal wastes, and some agricultural residues can compete with coal on costs. Um, it has to be said that in many cases, they will require initial pre-processing to ensure their combustion characteristics are suitable. However, where landfill taxation and gate fees raise the cost of landfill waste disposal, the economic case for a cement plant to self-produce RDF is stronger. So when I say RDF, I mean refuse derived fuel. Um, as this opens the door for cement plants to charge for accepting the waste, which could then be processed to RDF and used for energy purposes, uh, therefore strengthening the economics. Now discussing the sugar and ethanol industry, where we think that bioenergy also has untapped potential to scale up. So around 90% of global sugarcane production occurs in 17 countries, most of which are in Latin America and Asia. And the combustion of biogas from sugarcane crushing in cogeneration plants is a standard industry practice. So there's nothing new there. Um, however, many sugar mill cogeneration systems operate in relatively low efficiency as they are only denied, uh, designed to meet on-site energy demand. Um, Therefore, we think that transitioning to high pressure cogeneration systems can increase surplus energy production, providing an additional revenue stream for mills. Uh, and the potential here is quite big. So if we look at the graph, we can see Bagas electrical capacity uh, reached 23 gigawatts in 2017. So that's around one fifth of global bioenergy capacity in the, in the power sector. And that's discounting the, the energy uh, production as well from, from the cogeneration, from the heat and steam. 
So uh, with this in mind, Brazil, India, Pakistan, and Thailand have introduced measures to raise bagasse cogeneration efficiency, but we do think there is untapped potential in these countries and also in other sugarcane cultivating countries. For example, uh, in Mexico, 85% of sugar mills offer scope to upgrade to higher efficiency cogeneration. So aside from increasing the efficiency of cogeneration, there are further ways to maximize the energy potential of sugarcane without increasing land area. So first of all, sugarcane straw is often left in a field with limited drivers for its collection. However, it could be used as a supplementary fuel with bagasse, uh, and opportunities to export surplus electricity can provide a financial incentive for greater straw collection, which in turn could improve air quality by avoiding the burning of this in the field, which uh, produces a lot of particulate matter. Uh, also, energy cane. Uh, so energy cane has a similar sugar content to regular sugar cane, but significantly increased uh, biomass yield, which could be used for energy purposes. So if all sugarcane cultivating, oh, excuse me, if all sugarcane cultivating countries exploited the potential of high efficiency cogeneration, sugarcane straw and energy cane, uh, this could theoretically more than double existing bagasse electricity generation and create a considerable surplus for export. You know, alternatively, with the development of cellulosic ethanol, uh, the, the straw, the bagasse, uh, etc. could also potentially be used for the production of uh, ethanol. Okay, now moving to transport biofuels. So, global biofuel production grew 4% in 2017, reaching 142 billion liters. Uh, which is equivalent in energy terms to around 83 MTOE. Now, over our forecast period, we anticipate biofuel production increasing around 15% by volume to 165 billion liters, 97 MTOE in energy terms. Now, ethanol accounts for two thirds of growth in that forecast, uh, growing at around 2% per year and reaching 119 billion liters while biodiesel and hydro-treated vegetable oil, or HVO, uh, combined uh, grows by around 3% per year, reaching 46 billion liters by the end of the forecast. Now, Asian countries account for half of growth in the forecast, and this is mainly because increasing gasoline and diesel demand drives domestically produced biofuel consumption as a means of offsetting petroleum product and crude oil imports. Um, key policies in Asia are China's expansion of E10, so gasoline with 10% ethanol, from 11 provinces to nationwide, India's new biofuels policy, which widens the permitted feedstock base for ethanol production, and Indonesia's expansion of its B20 mandate, so 20% biodiesel, to new market segments uh, within the uh, domestic uh, outlook. Um, Brazil's biofuel output increases more than any other country. Uh, you can see that there on the left-hand side. Uh, biofuel market prospects are supported by a recovery in transport fuel demand and also improved biofuel production economics from the Renova Bio policy, which is due to start in 2020. Uh, while in the EU and the USA, so in the USA, uh, we think uh, ethanol output will stabilize so it is the global leader in terms of ethanol production, uh, but we find that that will stabilize due to the increasing efficiency of the vehicle fleet and hitting the corn ethanol limit in the federal renewable fuel standard. Um, and we anticipate that EU biodiesel output will contract due to weaker policy support post 2020 in the updated renewable energy directive, and perhaps more importantly, declining diesel demand uh, due to more efficient vehicles but also in terms of new vehicle registrations, uh, drift towards uh, gasoline and new uh, vehicle uh, registrations as opposed to diesel. So that was the, the main case. Uh, in Renewables 2018, we also have an accelerated case for transport biofuels as well as electricity. So within our accelerated case, uh, ethanol production could increase by 26 billion liters more so shown in blue, 
So that's around 20% higher than the main case. And this is based on uh, strong exports and higher consumption of higher ethanol blends. So E15, 15% uh, ethanol, and E85, 85% ethanol uh, in the United States. In Brazil, uh, it would need smooth introduction of Renova Bio and low levels of lost capacity from sugar mills, which are in debt which is uh, quite a substantial number of mills uh, currently in quite a precarious financial position. Um, so we need these not to be lost to meet the accelerated case. Um, in China, fulfillment of its 10% uh, nationwide mandate for ethanol. While in India, higher growth in the accelerated case needs the removal of logistics barriers. So that's interstate taxes, permits, a constrained refinery storage capacity, which inhibits uh, growth. Now, biodiesel and HVO, which is more known in North America as renewable diesel, uh, could grow by around 14 billion liters more. So that's around a third above the main case. Uh, and this will be reliant on uh, Argentina opening up new export markets. Uh, in Brazil, delivery of a 15% mandate, which has been uh, proposed uh, to scale up over time from 10% now to 15%. Uh, and India kick-starting a used cooking oil biodiesel production uh, with a better collection of used cooking oil and potentially a formalized uh, B5 mandate. Well, it also assumes full compliance with the B20 mandate in new sectors um, in Indonesia, which extends the use of biodiesel there to industry and to railways, etc. So overall, uh, in the accelerated case, conventional biofuel production could reach 206 billion liters by 2023, which is around 25% higher than the main case. Now, higher oil prices over the first three quarters of 2018 supported biofuel competitiveness versus petroleum products in key markets. So it's particularly relevant for US and Brazilian ethanol due to its lower cost of production than biodiesel. And a key reason for this is lower sugarcane and corn uh, feedstock costs compared to soybean oil, which is a key feedstock for biodiesel in both these countries. What we can see here is the break-even crude oil price for ethanol and biodiesel versus gasoline and diesel. So this is the oil price at which the production cost for the biofuel would be roughly equivalent to the costs of the fossil fuel competitor, whether that is diesel or gasoline. So Brent crude prices in the region of around 65 to 85 dollars per barrel, shown by the shaded area, um, over the first three quarters of 2018, and favorable taxation compared to gasoline, boosted consumption of unblended ethanol in Brazil, uh, so that's consumption at the pump, uh, by, of hydrous ethanol, it's called. Um, and another contributing factor to biofuel competitiveness in Brazil versus the USA is actually higher gasoline and diesel production costs. So this can be explained by the fact that the USA benefits from economies of scale, from larger and more sophisticated refineries, the use of low-cost natural gas as a process fuel, and optimization of the refinery slates produce a higher share of fossil transport fuels. So on one side, there is the production cost of the biofuel, but on the other side, there is the production costs of uh, fossil transport fuels, which are not uniform uh, globally. Now, Renewables 2018 uh, also forecasts production of less technically mature novel advanced biofuels. Uh, so these are produced from non-crop non feedstocks. Um, shown on the left-hand side, our main case sees output reach around 1.4 billion liters in 2023. So that's around three times 2017 levels, which is positive. However, it still only equates to 1% of total biofuel production in 2023. So it's scaling up but from a low base. Now, what I should say here is we're not talking here about um, used cooking oil based biodiesel and hydro treated vegetable oil, uh, because these are more mature technologies. We're focusing in on less mature technologies for advanced biofuels. So let's say cellulosic ethanol or thermochemical routes uh, for diesel substitute fuels. Now, in our main case here, we only assume one in five announced projects is delivered. And this highlights that many projects struggle to obtain the necessary uh, finance to proceed from development to construction. Now, in our accelerated case, shown by the dotted line, we see production could be 65% higher than the main case. So 
that's around 2.3 billion liters. And the key difference here is a more favorable investment climate means a higher share of the project pipeline is realized. So this would require efficient and reliable performance from the first commercial plants to lower investment risk in new projects and also assumes more widespread policy support. So for example, quotas providing guaranteed fuel offtake and financial de-risking measures. Now looking at the right-hand side graph, uh, three quarters of announced and under construction uh, novel advanced biofuel plants uh, are in Europe, uh, the USA and India, where policy support is available. So in Europe, we have member state quotas and policies for advanced biofuels in certain countries, uh, and also the updated Renewable Energy Directive framework outlines that novel advanced biofuel demand should, uh, should provide around 3.5% of transport fuel demand by 2030. In the United States, the Renewable Fuel Standard and Low Carbon Fuel Standard both support advanced biofuels, while India's new biofuel policy uh, includes tax incentives, 15-year offtake from oil marketing companies, and the ambition to deliver 12 commercial scale plants in the coming years. We also looked at the use of sustainable aviation fuels, and particularly aviation biofuels. Um, now, we, we see that demand for biofuels from the aviation sector is very clear. So alongside energy efficiency and carbon offsetting, blending aviation biofuels is a key means of ensuring that the industry's long-term decarbonization goals can be met. So at the current time, over 150,000 flights using blended aviation biofuels have taken place. However, Aviation biofuel cost premiums over fossil jet fuel are a barrier to uptake. So various production pathways are approved for blending with fossil jet kerosene. However, only one uh, shown in the light blue, uh, heifer fuel, so hydroprocessed esters and fatty acids, uh, is currently technically mature and commercialized. Um, so we do think that heifer production costs could reduce. So firstly, through economies of scale from refineries designed for continuous production. And secondly, the approval of Heifer Plus, which is shown on the far left, uh, which is currently in the approval process for use in aviation. Now this has a slightly lower uh, quality specification, more similar to HVO used in road transport, but also a lower cost. Um, however, we do expect it to be competition with road transport for the lowest carbon waste oil and animal fat feedstocks uh, used uh, for these fuels. Um, and therefore, a reduction in feedstock costs is maybe not anticipated. So this means that the best prospects for competitively priced heifer in the near term are either higher crude oil prices, which of course are not possible to control from the aviation industry. Uh, so we're talking here over $100 per barrel, or policy support to cover the cost premiums which is $70 per barrel oil, around 35 cents per liter, with leeway either way for the different production costs, uh, are very specific to each, each facility. Um, now, in the long term, aviation biofuel technologies will need more technologies will need to commercialize to access a wider feedstock base and increase, in, increase production volumes. So these uh, pathways on the right-hand side, uh, for example, Fisher Trough, which are approved, uh, but not fully commercialized, will need to come into the market and therefore increase the volume of uh, aviation biofuels available. Now on this slide, there's a couple of points that we can make. So what we're showing here is the cost premium for a 15% blend of uh, heifer biofuels uh, expressed on a per passenger basis for these destinations from London. Um, so first of all, as the efficiency of the aviation fleet increases, the overall cost of blending uh, biofuels reduces uh, in total terms, but also on a per passenger basis. And the second point then is in the long term, if cost premiums reduce, the industry may seek to include the additional uh, expenses from biofuel blending within the service cost. But even looking at here at current heifer prices, uh, the additional cost per passenger for a 15% blend may not be prohibitively high compared to other elements that affect ticket prices, um, such as the seating class or the time the ticket is purchased. So this is, of course, very much an individual, uh, personal uh, viewpoint on whether you feel that um, you know, an extra 
$15 or $17 on a flight to Tokyo is prohibitive or not. Uh, that's a personal choice, but um, overall, it's maybe not as high as some people may think. Now, working with the IEA's Advanced Motor Fuels Technology Collaboration Program, we explored how biofuels compare with fossil fuels uh, in terms of air pollutant emissions that affect human health, which is something that's not often, often considered. Um, now, there are two factors that affect uh, air pollutant levels. So first of all, it's the vehicle's engine and exhaust after treatment technology. And secondly, the characteristics of the biofuel compared with the fossil fuel being replaced. Now, for sophisticated vehicles that comply with the latest emission standards, most tailpipe air pollutant emissions reach very low levels, regardless of the fuel. But for older vehicles, uh, fuel type can significantly influence uh, emissions. So the graph shows the reduction in air pollutant emissions that can be achieved from biofuels relative to diesel for older uh, buses and medium freight trucks. So these are Euro 3 level uh, emission standards. So we can see here that with the exception of biodiesel and NOx emissions, uh, biodiesel and HVO can reduce air pollutants, while biomethane vehicles reduce air pollutant emissions the most compared to fossil diesel. Um, now, this can be beneficial in countries with older and less sophisticated vehicles operating in urban areas. So, for example, the air quality benefits from biofuels could be particularly valuable in India, in Indonesia, and Thailand which have a higher average age of vehicle scrappage and domestic biofuel consumption policies. In addition, in some countries, even new vehicles are built to lax emission standards. So for diesel vehicles in Indonesia, only plans to upgrade in 2020 from Euro 2 equivalent standards to Euro 4. Um, so for example, in Indonesia, there will be for many years to come uh, vehicles on the road that could potentially benefit uh, in, in air quality terms from biofuel use. Now, looking at the overall picture for renewable transport, to finish with this sector, um, on the left-hand side graph, we can see that biofuels accounted for around 90% of all the renewable energy in transport in 2017, with the rest from renewable electricity. In 2023, the picture does not change significantly, with the biofuel share only decreasing by a small amount. So the dominant share of biofuels is explained as industry growth started earlier and is facilitated by compatibility with internal uh, combustion engine vehicle fleets and fueling infrastructure. Conversely, with uh, increasing the renewable energy consumption in electric vehicles, of course, needs first of all a shift in the vehicle fleet, secondly, uh, charging infrastructure rollout, and thirdly, higher shares of renewables in electricity generation portfolios. Um, and these things are happening at the current time. Um, okay, now, secondly, um, sorry, just to pause for one second. Okay. Hi there, uh, just stop briefly because I think there was a technical problem with the sound. So I'm going to continue presenting, but if you cannot hear or if there's a sound problem, uh, by all means, uh, we should hopefully be able to resolve that. Um, so increasing fossil transport fuel demand means a change in the renewable share of transport demand uh, is relatively minor. So what we can see here uh, so we see the, the renewable share in transport increasing from 3.4% in 2017 to just 3.8% in 2023. So as such, transport has the lowest renewables penetration of all three sectors. Now on the right-hand side, uh, we can see that most biofuels are consumed in road transport with the potential untapped in aviation and marine transport uh, as the international nature of these sectors and uh, length of transport distances poses additional barriers. Now, looking out again, so looking across all three sectors, 
Uh, our accelerated case analysis highlights that non-bioenergy renewables in the electricity sector could grow by around 50 NTOE by the end of our forecast. However, the scale-up potential of bioenergy across the whole energy system is often overlooked. Uh, so our analysis indicates uh, that combined, this could provide around 60 MTOE if fully exploited. So something in the, in the approximate region of the electricity scale-up. Um, in addition, this would draw heavily on available waste and residue resources and therefore mitigate land use change concerns and provide additional waste management and in some cases, air quality benefits. However, we still feel that with any of this scale up of this nature, of course, robust sustainability frameworks will be key to ensure policymakers and other stakeholders that genuine greenhouse gas emissions reductions are delivered and wider environmental and social impacts are mitigated. So now to offer some conclusions and thinking back to the questions I, I raised at the beginning. Um, so bioenergy is the leading renewable energy source, accounting for half of all renewable energy consumption in 2017, and it also leads our forecast. Bioenergy deployment in the power sector is relatively stable over our forecast, and Asian countries lead development. Bioenergy use in industry hinges on the availability of on-site waste and residue resources, um, and the cement and the sugar and ethanol industries possess growth potential. By 2023, renewables only make small inroads in transport, with biofuels and renewable electricity together meeting 4% of demand. Uh, while road transport biofuels deliver most renewable consumption. Uh, under favorable market and policy conditions, the consumption of uh, bioenergy could scale up across the energy system. But as I said on the last slide, robust sustainability frameworks are key to ensure life cycle emission reductions while mitigating any potential environmental and social impacts. And we'll just move to our last slide here. So just to reiterate the Renewables 2018 market report, uh, is available from our, our web store, um, firstly for purchase, which comes with a full data set uh, and explores obviously this bioenergy content, but also a lot more relating to all renewable technologies. Um, also, if you visit the IEA Renewables 2018 page, there is a lot of information we also give for free in terms of the, the key results and, and an overview there. Um, also, we do a lot of work on sustainable bioenergy at the IEA. Uh, at the end of 2017, we launched a technology roadmap and delivering sustainable bioenergy, looking right out into the, the long term to 2050, 2060, and what needs to be in place to sustainably scale up bioenergy. And we also have some other publications, etc. So I will refer you to the links on this page. Okay, so what we will do now is uh, you have submitted some questions, which is excellent. So we're just going to uh, put the, the call on mute for the next three minutes or so. Uh, we'll just quickly go through the questions, pick out the ones we, we would like to answer, um, and then we'll come back to you. So please uh, bear with us for the next two or three minutes.
Hi there. Just to say, I'm I'm now back. Uh, we've had a look at the questions, and we can start to to answer some of these. Um, as you can see with the slide, it does have our email address. Um, so I am going to go through a selection of these questions. We won't have time to answer them all. So what we will do is, if there are if we haven't answered your question, uh, by all means, feel free to email uh, the IEA hyphen remr at iea.org, and we will certainly come back to you. Um, so I'll just uh, go through some of these questions that were raised, a very interesting selection. So first of all, about the air quality implications of bioenergy. So I, I talked on the slide about uh, potentially transport biofuels, offering some uh, benefits in terms of air quality in the transport sector. Now, in the heat sector, there's been implications of particulate matter from bioenergy. Uh, from less sophisticated use, certainly in open fires, um, in relatively simple stoves, etc., which can lead to high particulate matter. Uh, so certainly uh, the use of these basic stoves and open fires um, in urban areas should certainly be discouraged on air quality uh, grounds. But with uh, sophisticated uh, biomass pellet stoves, for example, uh, these can reach very, very low uh, PM emissions and actually um, can fully comply with, with the regulation. So, it's a case of technology choice. So it's very hard to say bioenergy uh, results in air quality emissions for uh, air pollutant emissions for heat. Generally, you can say certainly it does for certain uh, less sophisticated uses, uh, but certainly for most modern technologies, um, the uh, PM emissions can be managed. A uh, very simple question to answer, which is what, what are these forecasts based on? Is it the IEA's uh, new policy scenario, which is linked to our World Energy Outlook publication? Um, so for the electricity uh, capacity and generation uh, forecast, that's done by the Renewable Energy Division, uh, that's a specific analysis, and also the transport biofuels, and the NPS scenario is the basis for our renewable heat uh, data. But of course, the, the new policy scenario uh, of the World Energy Outlook goes right out a lot further than we do to 2040. Um, what's driving modern bioenergy? So if we think back to the earlier slides, we can see that most of it is in heat. Um, so 60% of, of, of the growth is still in heat. So that's use of bioenergy in large industrial sectors. Uh, where it's a uh, logical thing to do because the waste and residues are produced on site. Um, as we said, uh, we, we saw in the electricity sector, uh, bioenergy growth is roughly stable in capacity terms and et cetera. Uh, a lot, it's not having the same ramp up as we see in electricity and uh, as we see in uh, solar PV and wind. It is still growing, but that's not the major driver for growth. Uh, and in the transport sector, we do see some growth, as I said, in Asia and Latin America. Uh, with varied drivers for this. So these drivers are um, offsetting uh, oil imports and petroleum product imports, supporting demand for uh, ag agricultural commodities, um, and also uh, for uh, emissions reduction uh, as well. Um, yes, the, do we take account uh, in our transport biofuels forecast the latest uh, renewable energy directive? Uh, we do. Um, so while the directive kind of keeps the cap for uh, first generation conventional biofuels stable uh, with a maximum of 77%, uh, uh, but also locks it at the 2020 level, uh, plus 1% potentially, uh, we still see the, certainly for biodiesel, uh, the uh, slight contraction. This is because this policy framework is not going to push investment in any new production capacity. And therefore, with most of the policies being mandates, these are linked to the overall level of fuel consumption. So as vehicle fleets become more efficient, as they are in the EU already, and there's also very stringent uh, future uh, efficiency standards uh, that are going to be put in place, uh, so the diesel demand will go down, and therefore the mandate, mandated share will go down. And as I mentioned as well, there is also a drift in terms of new vehicle registrations in Europe from gasoline to, uh, sorry, from diesel back towards gasoline and also a growing uh, share, for example, for electric vehicles as well, although a lot smaller. Uh, in terms of transport in the long term, how do we see the contribution of biofuels versus, um, versus renewable electricity? Um, certainly, we think these are complementary options to decarbonize transport. So as shown on one of the later slides, uh, transport has a very low renewable share 
it's a very challenging sector to decarbonize. And certainly, uh, electric vehicles offer a lot of uh, benefits as electricity um, as electricity uh, networks are increasingly becoming uh, decarbonized with more renewables. Uh, there's certainly good emissions reduction potential there. Also, the removal of tailpipe emissions from air quality grounds, that's very positive. Uh, but the fact of the matter is there's still a lot of internal combustion uh, engine vehicles on the road and will be for our forecast period and well beyond. And therefore, we need decarbonization solutions for them too. And also looking more widely than road transport, uh, the high energy density of biofuels is particularly well aligned for road freight, but also particularly marine and uh, aviation, which I discussed. So we do see in terms of transport sector decarbonization, it's renewable electricity and biofuels, it's not either or. Uh, there's a question about the uh, US forecast and how this takes into account the decision to approve uh, year-round sales of 15%, uh, so E15 uh, ethanol blends. Um, so that could certainly provide a boost to the market. Uh, that's certain because there's certain service stations who wouldn't provide such a blend because of the disruption of having it only available for a certain part of the year. However, uh, service stations which have E15 is only around 1% of all US service stations, so it still takes time to scale that up, uh, that supply, and therefore it also needs to be competitive on cost with E10, 10% ethanol, which is standard. And there's other factors that are also counteracting that. So that's the increasing efficiency of vehicles, although the relaxation of the efficiency uh, standards in the US uh, may cause actually that to, to slow down. Uh, and there's also the renewable fuel standard, so there's a limit there for corn ethanol, which has already been met. So there are, there are other factors to take into account uh, as, a, as not just this uh, E15 uh, change in, in regulation, which has come this year. And secondly, there's the food versus the fuel, and how do we take into account of that with this potential to scale up? So uh, as, I, as I tried to reiterate in, in the presentation, most of the scale-up potential we wanted to highlight was around the use of waste and residues. Um, so this is not uh, taking more land use change, uh, for example. But also we must consider what's the potential with agriculture. So uh, when you look at the efficiency each year of the, the productivity per hectare, this is increasing. Um, there's also the areas of marginal land and unused land that could potentially for certain types of bioenergy be used. And also there's the yield gap. So if you look at the productivity per hectare in the United States, in Germany, and compare it with some other nations, there's a huge difference. So the question is, how does that balance of potentially getting more out of the land that's available free up any potential for energy purposes? Um, but we think in the first case, we've got to tackle the low-hanging fruit. And there's a lot of cases where we can uh, scale up, uh, as I think I've shown in the presentation, using waste and residues. So that was, I think, most of the questions, but um, any other questions that you have, I would suggest that you uh, certainly are welcome to email those to us, and uh, we will certainly come back to you using the email address provided. Now, what we will do, uh, we will share a uh, PowerPoint, and we will share the, the PDF of this uh, presentation after the webinar, so you will have the slide deck. Um, and um, yes, uh, yes, and you also, as I said, you're welcome to look at the Renewables 2008 uh, page of our uh, of the IEA website, which has some summary, uh, summary of the key results, and also has some in interesting information on bioenergy. Um, and then we will be back with uh, uh, Renewables 2019 um, in October, provisionally uh, of this year. So thanks for joining us um, and your interest in our bioenergy and renewable energy work. And um, I look forward to your questions if you submit them by email. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.